الحمد للہ و صلاۃ وسلام علی نبی محمد ولا علی و صحبی وسلم اما بیر حبت فلّہ ان کنٹمپرری ٹائمس مسلمس ایز اے نیشن فیس ان پریزیڈنٹ اٹیکس فرام آؤٹ سائڈ آر کمیونٹی اینڈ فرام ود ان وی فیس آئیڈیالوجیکل وار فیئر ایز ویل ایز فزیکل اٹیکس اپن آر پرسن آر پراپرٹی آر آنر اینڈ آر لینڈس سیکولرزم اینڈ ادر ایلین آئیڈیالوجیز آر بینگ فورسڈ اپن ایس اینڈ پراپگیٹڈ بائی سم فرام ود ان آر اون ویریس کمیونٹیز Even many, if not all, the same social ills that other communities face plague our youth, both at home in the West and abroad. The Salafi call, or menhaj, or methodology, if you will, it attempts to address the contemporary needs and issues faced by Muslims by exhorting Muslims to follow Islam in its pristine form. by returning back to the Quran and the authentic sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam and the understanding or methodology of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam radiyallahu ta'ala anhu radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een and in a beautiful ather of the salaf Imam It is attributed to Imam Malik Rahimahullah Ta'ala Who said Wahab bin Kisan used to sit with us And would not stand until he would say to us Know that the latter part of this affair Will not be corrected Except with what rectified the first part This shows us that it is imperative to never abandon creed never to abandon the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the origin and the masdar of the call to tawhid that if we want to rectify even with all of these new contemporary issues issues that yes indeed the salaf did not face it is still based upon the call to the book of allah and the sunnah of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the madhhab of the salaf as a template as a guide and that ijtihad or a scholarly a diligence to abstract ruling should come from those base sources and that this has no contradiction with the sunnah of the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wasallam sent the companion muadh ibn jabal radiyallahu ta'ala anhu to yemen to invite the yemenis to uh, embrace islam and to rule by islam meaning the purpose was to embrace islam and practice islam and of course the rulings of islam the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said how will you adjudicate if you need to make a judgment he said radiyallahu ta'ala anhu i will judge by the book of allah he said and if you do not find in the book of allah he replied i will judge by the sunnah of the messenger of allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam He said and if you do not find it in the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said I will strive utmost with my intellect and this is narrated in Abu Dawood This shows us that the methodology of the salaf as-salih and at the head of them is the sahaba radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in is that ijtihad is permissible and it is a part of the faith it is just that the asl as the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam mentioned in this hadith is going to the book of allah going to the sunnah of the messenger of allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and if you don't find anything there then going to 
the consensus of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and if you don't find anything there and from what the ulama of the past adjudicated then it is going back it is using one's meaning the ahl al-ilm using their ijtihad to make fatwa and use things like sound qiyas or analogies in order to deduce, deduce a ruling so this is imperative this is a part of the da'wah to ahl sunnah one of the most vocal critics of the salafi da'wah in more contemporary times in the west would probably be Dr. Yasser Qadi and I wrote this short rebuttal or observations of what I saw from Dr. Qadi's criticisms in an article he had entitled uh, on Salafi Islam and I entitled this Haram Dr. Qadi Haram on Salafi Islam and recently it has come to my attention someone has sent something to me uh, which shows Dr. Qadi has come out fully with his true colors although it's been a progressive or it has been a something in which he has been uh, a, you know has not it hasn't been a mystery of his deviation from the Salafi principles and his critique and criticisms of the Salafi Dawah and in fact I would say the Dawah to Ahlul Sunnah and him being a former Salafi if you will and his attempt to damage the Dawah although he cannot damage what Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala protects I still thought it was important to highlight some observations because there are many youth that follow him and many questions that we get from time to time about D Dr. Qadi and his menhaj and in fact I didn't really want to even uh, speak about these issues but I felt some obligation to at least highlight some points and in fact you'll find many rebuttals of his methodology uh, that are some of them detailed some of them are a bit more uh, maybe less detailed sometimes a bit emotional and you'll find some of those rebuttals that are useful uh, on the website salafimenhaj.com I found uh, some of their articles to be ben beneficial in this regard also there is a plethora of rebuttals probably the most that you'll find from uh, Salafi publications and their affiliates like Troid and so on and so forth that they have done a lot of work in this regard however I have not had the chance to go into a lot of their works but I think they realized a long time ago and have a lot of experience with regards to Yasser Qadi in knowing and seeing and observing his uh, deviation from the Salafi Menhaj and the issue here at this stage is not deviation from the Salafi Menhaj but it is the harms that we observe in Dr. Qas, Dr. Qadi's uh, coming out and his new uh, methodology if you will so some of the reasons that I even embarked on this rebuttal is because I found many in, uh, inaccuracies and inconsistencies in his Salafi Islam article and then most recently after listening to the podcast the recent podcast uh, that there were some observations there as well which definitely need to be highlighted and they illustrate that Dr. Qadi his new embracing of perhaps elements of as he said mysticism and he mentioned a voke and we'll talk about that a little bit if we can and he also mentioned 
and in fact came out about his uh, what we would refer to as Kutubism as an ideology that he embraces some aspects and he respects some of the heads of those contemporary scholars that uh, praise Sayyid Qutb and are in fact a kind of hybrid, if you will, of elements of the Salafi Dawa mixed with the thought and the ideology of people like Maududi and Sayyid Qutb. Is the understanding of the Salaf includes many fun fundamental issues that are completely neglected or even contradicted by contemporary Salafi groups. Additionally, there is a methodological flaw in attempting to extrapolate a Salafi position, uh, meaning a position that the Salaf would hold about a modern issue that the Salaf never encountered. The Salafi position, in quotes, meaning one that is held by some scholars of the modern Salafi movement with respect to questions on citizenship and nation states, democracy, the role of women in today's society, the permissibility of voting, and the issue of jihad in the modern world are merely personal opinions uh, of the scholars, and he mentions fat fatwa, of the scholars who pronounce them and cannot be representative of the views of the first three generations of Islam. So one of the issues that we have with a statement such as that is that first and foremost, there are not Salafi groups, although there may be con conflicts at times between individuals and so on and so forth. This discord is not representative of the usul of the Dawah to Ahl Sunnah, that this is a Dawah which is based on the book and the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and the methodology of the companions and it has been codified meaning that there are principles and there are rulings that are make up the foundation principles and so we make judgments about who is Salafi and who is not Salafi based upon those principles and as the scholars of Usul mention that the proof of something, the reality of something is in its substance, not in its name. So meaning that there may be those who attribute themselves or people considered to be Salafi, but in fact they are not practicing Salafiyah. They're not practicing those, uh, all of those usul or they're going against very important issues, maybe in takfir or maybe in Messiah jihad or all kind of other issues or with the issue of, as you mentioned, citizenship and voting and so on. So this means that of Ahlul Sunnah, that they have a methodology to operate from and regarding the issues you mentioned or that Dr. Qadi mentioned, we find that in contemporary times those who ascribe to the same methodology have a pretty strong consensus about those uh, issues, those contemporary issues. And those who disagree with them, you find that they have uh, mukhalifat or issues with regards to those usul and foundation principles in general. So it's very important that we are truthful with regards to dealing with this issue. Also, the issue of ijtihad, as we mentioned, that this is uh, something which is very important if, as we mentioned, the tartib uh, that uh, in the hadith of uh, Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he says, the scholar of usul of fiqh looks at sharia evidences and its levels and distinguishes between what is sharia evidence and what is not. And it requires analyzing the various levels of evidence until he can give preference to that which is strongest over that which is, uh, has weakness, if there is a contradiction between evidences. Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, if a fatwa of a companion is given to me, then I follow it and I do not deem it uh, permissible to disagree with it. So there's many uh, statements of the Salaf to show us, uh, and we, we mention more contemporary, obviously, not from the Salaf, Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, but we mention Imam Abu Hanifa, and there's many, many statements like this which show 
the methodology for coming up with fatwa. And that, of course, there are many masail where there are no texts, there are no divine texts. However, it's still never departing from those divine texts. And that is the difference between the Salafi Minhaj and many of, of the other sects and groups of contemporary times that they depart and uh, more often than not, they take other sources and sometimes it may even be whimsical. So in order to give us some insight into Dr. Qadi's, uh, his newfound way, I thought it would be relevant for us and useful for us to kind of have some sort of scheme to be able to, to look into uh, the statements of Dr. Qadi and see how they lie on the perspective, on the, in relation to the various perspectives uh, and approaches that are being, that are fairly prominent in contemporary uh, Islamic understandings and discourse. So one of the things I noticed uh, in relation to the statements of what I understood from the statements of Dr. Qadi in the, uh, from his Salafi Islam, and then now his new progression from the uh, recent podcast is that he is moving, he believes he's moving on a kind of a, uh, a very progressive path. You know, Qadi progressivism, I called it. Okay, this is just for our understanding, these labels. Uh, and he is very critical of the Salafi Minhaj, and I put that here, the Salaf, Tariqa to Salaf. And I put that in the center for a, a, a reason because the tariqa to salaf, the, the minhaj and the methodology of the salaf asari is ahkam and it is aslam. It is the safest and it is the, the, the most, uh, the, the best for understanding. It, meaning that it is the, the most uh, profound and it is the one that should be considered. Is that's the madhab of the salaf. And we're gonna talk about that more uh, in the future or in the, in the video to come. So what we see, also we have another path, progressive modernist. I wanna speak very quickly on that as well. So both of them, they criticize in essence saying that the madhab of the salaf, the progressive modernist they say that it's too rigid. Yasser Qadi also says that these, the, the minhaj and the Salafi approach, this literalism, as they say, uh, is too rigid. It's too rigid for contemporary issues. So uh, they say it's rigid and it doesn't address contemporary issues. Dr. Qadi, there's a commonality in this point uh, that they criticize the Salafi approach as being too rigid and not addressing contemporary issues. Uh, issues and social issues and political activism and things like this. Dr. Qadi, he mentioned that. He's always talking about going forward, going forward, like going beyond, you know, to move from where he once was to a new, uh, more progressive stance and a more progressive approach, methodology. It's in fact, it's a minhaj. It's not just uh, a couple of points that he has, has uh, differed with from his past. And we'll talk about some of his actual statements very shortly. So he's looking forward. Uh, the madhab of the Salaf or the Salafi approach doesn't address. And uh, some of the other points, as far as the progressive modernists, they will support LGQT movements, you know, the lesbian, gay, transsexual, queer movement. Okay? So they believe that, you know, basically they come together with liberalism. And that includes uh, a lot of their social ideas as well as their uh, their social interactions with people, you know, so they, they can accept that, you know, they just, for them it's just about uttering the statement of la ilaha illallah, considering themselves Muslim, and, uh, you know, you'll find in their literature that they quote from people like Bob Marley, Bob Dylan, and Plato, as well as Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu and others, but the, the odd thing is you will find that they're always questioning the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu So you'll find amongst them the, those Qur'aniyun, or some who totally are Qur'aniyun, who totally negate the Sunnah, but they're always questioning the authenticity of those things which do not go in accordance with their intellect. So they really rely on rationalism. Okay, that's the, these groups. 
Dr. Qadi, as I mentioned, he also criticized Salafis and, and more or less the Medhab of the Salaf for not being able to deal with contemporary issues, as we mentioned in the quote in the beginning of the video. And where Yasser Qadi differs, and we have to be honest and truthful, uh, you know, we see that, and he mentions Safar and Salman being his inspiration, and he mentions that he believes that Salman Oda is the Ibn Taymiyyah of this era because of the, his imprisonment and because of his, uh, you know, willingness to speak the truth as, as, as he believes and, you know, more or less to speak out against leaders, you know, and call for what he calls to. So he believes uh, Yasser Qadi also questions, as he mentions, he says the truth is somewhere in between as far as listening and hearing and obeying the rulers. He's not like those tekfiris that are, you know, the extremists of ISIS and Daesh and so forth. But he takes a more, and he's definitely not like the Salafis, you know, and not like the the Minhaj of, you know, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, The Prophet Sallallahu said, Hear and obey the Muslim ruler uh, in that which you love and that which you dislike, as long as he doesn't command you in disobedience to law. And if he commands you to disobedience to law, then there's no hearing and obeying. And as the Salafis and Ahl Sunnah uh, mentions, that this, is a, the, this does not gate, negate obedience to the ruler in entirety it means in that command of disobedience so if the ruler commands you to drink alcohol you do not rebel against the ruler but you do not drink alcohol that that is uh disobedience to a law and he has no authority over you in that uh in that call to do disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala however the takfiris negate that Yasser Qadi is somewhere in between and he supports the political activism uh, he rejects, he also mentions that he rejects unbridled liberalism. So meaning he doesn't go with this, uh, he says, you know, although we, you know, may be able to find some sort of middle course or that we, uh, t we have a tolerance in the societies that we live as Muslim minorities. And in this, res in this re regard, he's correct that our tolerance, because we don't believe in violence and we don't believe in these kind of and insanity that we see with Daesh and these extremist groups, but at the same time we don't accept homosexuality. So there he agrees with really the Salafi position in Muslim minority lands. Uh, and he rejects the unbridled liberalism of these people who are just like, yeah, gung-ho, let's sit on the panel with the LGBTQT community <coughs> and, and so on and so forth. He rejects their, their extreme liberalism. And this is primarily because of their un-Islamic morality, you know, so he doesn't accept those things. So those are some of the things that we want to mention. So I drew this, this diagram and it also even has a precedence in the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam in the Hadith of uh, uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala in which he said that, he, he said, uh, Khatta لنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خطا. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم drew a line. Okay, and this is similar, and that's why I put this in the middle. وقال ثم قال هذا سبيل الله. This is the path of Allah. So we're saying the Salafi discourse or narrative is that this is the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Surat Allah Mustaqim, Surat the Surat al Mu'minin, the path of the Salaf Asali, Ridwan Allah alayhi. So the Prophet he drew a line, Khatta Lana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam khattan thumma khatta khututin an yaminihi wan shimali. Then he made one on the right, and so I made that one on the right. It's kind of like Yasser Qadi's new progressivism and his looking forward contemporary uh, way of dealing with many issues and even challenging Aqidah and its, and its importance. ثُمَّ خَطَّ عَلَى يَمِينِ وَعَنْ شِمَالِي Then there, he, the Prophet Sallallahu drew on the left another path. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ثُمَّ قَالْ هَذَهِ سُبُو مُتَفَرَّكَ those are the paths, the divided paths, meaning they divided from the, the straight path, Suratullah Mustaqim. 
على كل سبيل منها شيطان يدعو له يدعو إليه. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, at the end of each one of these paths is a shaitan that calls to it. So if we look at all the groups and sects, they are all headed. This is from the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, authentic nas of the Messenger of Allah وسلم. So many ahadith would show us that we would divide. It's not that we like division. Division is uh, is rejected in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us, وَأَتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَقُوا Hold on all of you steadfast to the rope of Allah and do not divide. But the rope of Allah is the book of Allah. And the rope of Allah is the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's, it's, it's authentic Islam. It's not our whims and what in our desires, nor is it the various paths that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said. He drew a line in the middle and he said, Hadha sabila Allah. And he threw, thumma khata ala yamini wa ala shimali. Then he drew one on the right and the left. And he said, Hadha hi sabul. Those are the various paths. At the end of each one, there's a shaitan that calls to it. The shaitan may not even be aware that they're calling to something other than the book and other than the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and other than the Sabeel al -Mu'mineen. And something very important with our da'wah, da'wah to Ahlul Sunnah, as our Shaykh Imam Muqbil bin Hadi al he said this beautiful statement. He said, da'wah to Ahlul Sunnah, da'wah to min kitabi la ila kitabi la wa min sunnati Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ila sunnati Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said the da'wah of Ahlul Sunnah it is the, the call from the book of Allah, meaning the Qur'an, the divine speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, perfect speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the book of Allah to the book of Allah. And from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, to the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, letting us know that the call always remains to the book and the sunnah and the minhaj of the salaf al -Salih. The minhaj of the salaf al -Salih. The Prophet sallallahu said, khayr al -Nas the best people is those of my generation, then those follow them, then those follow them. So wouldn't it be most appropriate with all the evidence we know from the book and the sunnah to follow that sabila mu'minin hatta namut until we die? As the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith of Hudayfa bin Yaman also showing that we would split and that we need to adhere to the jama'ah and if there is no jama'ah wala imam then bite onto the uh, the bark of a uh, of a tree until you die meaning hold fast to the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam even if you're alone that that path it should not be on whims and desires and the point i wanted to mention because we see from what dr qadi is saying and we're going to get into some of those statements is that he has it's not just his progressiveness and we're not talking about just fiqh mu'amalat. We're not just talking about issues of political participation and social activism. We're not just talking about those things. But we're actually talking about a whole approach, as he mentioned, Vogue. Now he is taking a more mystical approach. And he's saying, you know, that, you know, Aqidah kind of questioning, and there's kind of a belittlement of the importance in Aqidah. And the importance, you know, instead, you know, as long as you're calling to a path from the so-called alleged uh, Sunni schools of thought, then... You know, just be, let the people practice their religion and be strong. You know, go to the masjid, you know, if you're Ashari, if you're Sufi, if you're Jamaat Tabliq, if you're Khwana Muslimin, if you're Salafi, if you're uh, Takfiri, Jihadi, you know, as long as you're, you're, you're practicing and you have this, uh, this, you know, and you're on your Aqidah that you believe is straight, you know, as long as, of course, it doesn't go outside the books of Islam, I'm sure he would say that. Uh, then it's okay. But this goes against that whole medheb. It makes ta'til of the whole medheb of the salaf. So one of the shuba or doubts that Dr. Qadi he mentions, he mentions that he has a shift uh, in his thinking, that he has had a paradigm shift. And when we refer to a paradigm shift, that means it's something whole scale. His whole outlook has changed from what it previously was. And he's made it very clear that his previous training uh, in his previous aqidah or creed being that which uh, he said was grounded in the creed of Ahla Athar, meaning as we mentioned prior to this, uh, the Salaf Saleh or Ahla Hadith, he says that he now has a more, he's more, he's embracing a more spiritual and mystical approach to Islam. And I ask, what is more spiritual than the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and what is more spiritual than the minhaj of the salaf al-salih? In all of those athar and those narrations where the salaf 
uh, mention about coming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being uh, and all of those uh, who are known as Ubad, those people who worshiped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who Allah wa ta'ala mentions that when they hear the Quran, that they, you know, it, 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 it inspires fear in their heart. It instills fear in their heart and it causes their skin, you know, the hair on their skin to raise out of khashya, out of khushur, and they have khushur in their ibadah. So who is more spiritual than the Salaf? Uh, also, Dr. Qadi, he mentioned, he said, people accuse us of following our desires. So he's aware of this shubha. He's aware of this, that, that people have accused him and will accuse him and attack him for this immense paradigm shift that he's had. But I ask, you speak about Volk. What could be more whimsical as a source of inspiration? What could be more fickle and quick changing from person to person and differing than something that is just about inspiration and your inspired love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is not deduced from uh, uh, the text? And we're going to look at this concept of vok in the people of Tasawwuf, because this is a terminology that the, the Sufiya use, and we need to have an understanding. What does it mean, Vok, that uh, uh, Yasser Qadi is referring to? So all throughout the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, and in accordance with the Madhab of the Salaf al-Saleh, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He considers, desires, uh, hawa as something mithmum, as a characteristic which is mithmuma, which is uh, a sinful and negative characteristic, meaning not your natural inclination to have relations with your spouse or something, but following your desires, meaning follow bid'ah, following innovative practices, following your desires, and leaving the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, leaving kitab Allah wa sunnah of Rasul ﷺ, for example, saying there's many different aqidahs and they're all okay to follow. It doesn't matter, just choose one. But we have more important issues to deal with, like social matters. This is a way of following your desires because this... It doesn't go back to the sources of Islam, to Kitab Allah wa Sunnah to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because our source of rectification is through correct aqidah and practice and implementation of the book in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Madhab of the Salaf. And this is how we rectify, and this is how we rectify everything from our hearts to our society. So Allah wa Ta'ala says, Fi Kitab al Kareem, Women and Nasi may. Allah Ta'ala says, في كتاب الكريم, in Surah Al-Hajj, He Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, and from the people there are those who worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Allah harf, meaning they, they, wash, they worship Allah tabarak wa ta'ala with doubt. They have doubt. And what illustrates more doubt than to change from creed to creed or to accept something, especially with regards to aqidah and minhaj, that was unacceptable before and what we were upon before was based on kitab wa sunnah. So what could be more, uh, a better illustration of hawa and desires than that? And 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 ya budun al ya budun Allah harf and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa taala with doubt. And then Allah subhanahu wa taala describes those people. He said, "The in asabhu khair." So if this person, if if goodness uh, comes to this person, atma in nabi, then he is comfortable. He is he's he's relaxed with that. He accepts that. He is happy. He rejoices in that. And if fitna comes to him, any tests, any trials and tribulations, then he changes. He changes on his, uh, you know, he changes his, his paradigm, in fact. He changes his face. He changes his paradigm. He changes his outlook. He changes his uh, ability to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Khasira dunya wal akhira. He is a loser in this life. He has destroyed this life and the hereafter. And that one, he is a khusran mubin. It is clear, uh, uh, you know, clear destruction. That's clear misguidance. Shaykh al Salam ibn Taymiyyah says about this ayah, he mentions something. He says, 
وهذه حال متبع للهوا للهواه شيخ الاسلام ابن تيميه he says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here he mentions the condition Condition of who? The condition of the one who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in doubt. He's fickle. He's quick change, but he grows. He's growing into new aqidahs. He's growing into new outlooks. He's growing into new spirituality, and now he is dhulq. Wow, that's powerful. And he said, and wahabihi hal al mutaba' li hawahu. This is the status, or this is the condition of the one who follows his desires. الذي إن حصل له ما يحواه من الدنيا عبد الله. The one who finds that if if he attains from his الذي إن حصل له ما يحواه من الدنيا عبد الله. If he finds that which he is uh, he attains that which he is striving to get from his his desires. Then he worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if he gains what he's looking for, he worships Allah. So he says, and if he does not find, or if, if he doesn't, if he if he finds that which tests his, his faith, you know, test him in his his dunya, in his worldly things. He leaves the religion. How many people do we know like this? We're not saying Dr. Qadi has left his de deen. At all, we're not saying that. So make, make sure you understood. We understand that we're talking about the most extreme cases. And the point of mention in this verse, Ahabatifillah, is to show the disease and the destruction of the one who follows his or her desires. And they give his and her desires preference over the book and the sunnah and over the madhab of the salaf, that it is a path which leads to destruction. Fidunu al akhirah. And he says, This is the condition of the one who is sick. Marid. Fi iradati wa qastihi. He's sick in what he desires and his intention. And this is the condition of the people of desires, the people who try to follow their, you know, they're, they're following their sexual desires or their passions and so on and so forth, meaning in a negative way. And the people of uh, desires as far as Ahl al Bid'ah. Imam al Sa'di, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says about this ayah, Women and Nas. من هو ضعيف الإيمان لم يدخل إيمان قلبه ولم تخالطه بشاشته بل دخل فيه إما خوفا وإما عادة على وجه لا يثبت عند المحن إمام سعدي says about this ayat he says that from the people are those who are weak in faith. And that Iman, Iman doesn't truly enter this person's heart. Nor does it mix and beautify his heart. Rather, the, the, the desires, they enter into it. Either out of fear that this person they follow their desires, or that they are they turn their selves away from iman, and that is because their iman has not been strong during times of tribulation. So this shows us a habatifillah the importance of strong iman and not not letting our iman and our desires and our hope for unity, and our hope for this, and our hope for that, to overcome the haq, which is based on the book, and the sunnah, and the madhab of the salaf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we kitab al kirim also showing us the dangers of desires, and how they can be beautified for us, but they are just leading us astray. And that is with regard, regards to the two ways the shaitan comes to you, through shubahat and shahwat. Through shubahat, meaning doubtful issues, 
uh, being not being uh, firm upon the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and changing from minhaj to minhaj, methodology to methodology, paradigm to paradigm, or being a person of desires, following your evil desires and wicked nafs and the whisperings of the shaitan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, fi kitab al kareem afaman zuyina lahu su'u amalihi farahu hasana فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُدِلُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ فَلَا تَذْهَبَ نَفْسَكَ عَلَيْهِمْ حَسَرَاتْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ بِمَا يَسْنَعُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, في كتاب الكريم, Is he then to whom the evil of his deeds is made fair-seeming, so that he considers it as good meaning good and equal to the one who is rightly guided. Verily, Allah sends astray whom he wills and guides whom he wills. So do not destroy yourself in sorrow for them. Truly, Allah is the all-knower of what they do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that the people of desires, that he gives them subhanahu wa ta'ala from his divine wisdom, he gives them opportunities in his justice. However, unfortunately, we tend to follow our desires instead of following the tariqah, uh, the, 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 the sound uh, path that Allah Ta'ala has given us and uh, commanded us to follow his Surat Al-Mustaqeem Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says Fi Kitabi Al-Kareem Min yahdi Allah fuwa muhtad Wa min yudlil falan tajida lahu waliyin murshida Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says Fi Kitabi Al-Kareem And whoever Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala guides then he is guided and whoever he leaves to stray, then he will find no protector who can give him guidance. So we ask for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us, guide us away from our hoa and our desires and from going astray, like the people who let their desires and their feelings and their newfound spirituality lead them away from the Saratullahi al mustaqim Dr. Ka, Dr. Qadi, he mentions this folk that he mentions this in the beginning of his uh, his interview, and he mentions you know and makes ishara. He doesn't really go into detail in explaining, and so what we find from Ahla Tasawwuf, and as a linguistic term, first and foremost, it means to taste. So we can infer that he's referring to like to taste sweetness, the taste the sweetness of Iman, which all of us want to taste the sweetness of Iman, but we want to do it as a tariqah shari'iyah, as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, those who taste the sweetness of Iman, the one who's afraid to go back to kufr after guidance, after his Islam, and the others that he mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, Dr. Qadi, it seems after he mentioned his mysticism and so on and so forth, we can infer that he's probably referring to what Ibn Arabi mentioned and said, "Ilam and the vok in the qom, awl mubadi to jelly, wahua hal yufjal abd fi qalbihi." He says, "Know that the vok, you know, this tasting, this lava, this sweet, sweet taste that you get to a certain people, meaning probably ahlul tasawwuf." That is, that which is first, it begins in the heart. Or it is manifested in the heart. You know, revealed in the heart. And it is the, the condition in which a servant has been awakened within his heart. So how is it that we can find a path, and this shows the difference between Ahlul Sunnah and the people of desires, especially many of the Sufi sects and many of the rationalists, that they look, they believe they have to begin, instead of going to the book and the Sunnah for their creed, they begin through inspiration, through divine, what they believe is divine inspiration, as they say, by reflecting on the, the signs and reflecting on the creation before the ayat. And they use that, some of them, the most extreme of them, use that as evidence uh, with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his sifat and, and other aspects of the religion. Whereas Ahlul Sunnah 
goes to the d divine text because they realize that the divine text is not only safety and security, but it is, for example, the Quran is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's perfect. It's the Kalam Allah, Azza wa Jal. So it's perfect, and that is the communication that we begin with by reading the book of Allah, Azza wa Jal. By reading his ayat, if we want to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what he wants from us and have that spirituality come to us and that sweetness of iman, if we want to taste that, we, we get it beginning with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then we reflect what tadabr ala ayati. We, then we reflect upon the, the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his, his, his signs. Women ayati a layla wa nahar wa shamsu al qamr. You know, and from his signs is the day and the night. And the sun and the moon, we reflect, that's, that illustrates the rububiya, the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he created everything in his creation. But we learn that, and the sweetness of that, and what really shows us that, and what it means, and how it fits into the divine scheme, and how our purpose is to worship him and him alone, that comes from the book of Allah. I have not created mankind in the jinn except for the purpose of worshiping me. How would you know that divine purpose by just looking at the trees and just trying to find the leather than faith? Now, I'm not saying it's not beautiful. I love the mountains. I love to hike. I love to see the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to get in the river, to jump in the river. I love it. But I don't begin that with that as the master of my iman. And I don't, that's not the, the origin, but it comes from the book in the sunnah. That's your evidence for your religion. And that's where the true sweetness comes from. Another thing Dr. Qadi, he mentioned, he said, the more a person studies, the more a person grows and is inevitably, and inevitably they change their positions. But to remain stagnated on the same views that you have when you had 20, when you were 20, even after you have reached the age of 40, 50, and 60, it really shows you have not been studying. SubhanAllah. So I ask, what about all the scholars in Islam and scholarship of Islam? That's not even just Salafi scholars, but we're talking about all the scholars throughout history and especially those who didn't leave the, the, the path and stayed upon the sunnah of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Yes, they grew in their faith. Yes, they gained more knowledge. Yes, they changed positions in fatawa and, and, and issues and even sometimes issues in ittaqad to correct themselves. But to say that you haven't studied because you don't because you're not whimsical, because you're not changing every four or five years with a new aqidah to where you're now from Ahla Tasawwif, when you were Kanam and Ahla Athar from Ahla Tasawwif, or from Ahla Athar to Shi'i, or to Ahla Athar to then leaving, leaving the religion in totality, this is what we see is usually the natija for people who are changing in their faith. That they change one day their Takfiri, one day their Sufi, the next day their Salafi, then they maybe even leave the religion. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for ikhlas with the bat ala sunnah. So to me, I see that as a false claim and a claim which is almost a type of ta'an or a type of slander against the ulama of Islam. All of those who came before you. As if you have now real, you have now come to that realization, and you've come to that high understanding. Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah was less fortunate than you, I guess. I guess Imam Ahmed couldn't quite get what you got from Yale, and I guess Imam Abu Hanifa just kind of messed up. He didn't really, you know, he didn't he didn't uh, 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 transform. He didn't evolve his thinking. Wallah musta'an la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. That Dr. Qadi mentioned, he said, lived realities are different than book realities. And that's true. But however, we're still restricted to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And that doesn't mean we can transgress the bounds of Allah wa ta'ala. He says, these creeds that we are wed to also have elements of human products in them. Just like most Salafis understand, the madhabs are products of human developments. 
So there's no doubt that human interpretation is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this ability. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us his divine speech, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the revelation of the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and made it clear for us. And with that being the case, no doubt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us and completed his religion. Al yom akmalta lakum dinukum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa radaytu islama dina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says for Kitab al Kareem that this day I perfected my religion upon you and am pleased with Islam for you as a religion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen is complete. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has likewise given a role for humankind. And that is an interpretation. But our parameters of interpretation and our parameters for understanding the creed is restricted to the Salaf of this Ummah because the Prophet والسلام, as a part of his guidance let us know that there's a Salaf and that he had Sahaba and that their interpretation their understanding is what we rely upon and the tabi'een would tabi'een as the as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said khayran nas qarni thumma alladhina yulunuhum thumma alladhina yulunuhum the best people are those people of my generation then those who follow them then those who follow them so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has let us know that the first three generations of islam that they and their interpretation is to be followed. That that is how we, we set the parameters. So Ahlul Sunnah does not reject the place of the intellect. We just don't make, take the intellect over the divine text. So we begin with the divine text for our solutions. And we use the intellect, the intellect for interpretation, of course. And we restrict our interpretation to that which came before us. Unless there is room for ijtihad. And when it comes to creed and itikad, that is that bab is tawqifiya. It's it's closed. It's a it's a door that is closed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the religion and perfected it. And the creed is contained in the Quran and the Sunnah. So we don't need to now go out and and, and add some things. Add the, the homosexual movements and add uh, you know communism and add socialism uh, you know, as a part of our, you know, incorporating them and using the ayat to to try to gain the greater truth and the greater realities and the greater principles in the faith, and then leave off all the details of the deen in order to accept newly invented matters and ideologies. So, Doctor Qadi, he mentions another point I want to mention is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sent the messengers that Ahim Abdul Salatu Salam. And the messengers that him after Salat to Salam were what? They were human beings. And they were sent from Bani Adam to give Bani Adam the message so that the people wouldn't, it wouldn't seem strange to them and it wouldn't be unacceptable and it wouldn't be, you know, it was people from amongst them. Alayhim Abdul Salat to Salam. And so if we hold on to the, the principles of, of Dr. Qadi, and we accept that creed is open to human error, you know, mistakes in Aqidah, all creeds are, are mistaken, uh, then this opens the door to our whims and our desires. You're opening the door to bid'ah, to aberrations in the faith and disbelief similar to the nations before us after the message became clear. They didn't divide, the groups and sects didn't divide until the message became clear. That's when they begin to debate and disbelieve and argue and dispute. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the messenger, made the messenger, gave 
revealed the revelations and sent the messengers to make things clear. Things were made clear, then the people began to divide. Then the people broke into sects. Then the people began uh, disputing about their deen. So this is the destruction of the nations before. And this is why Islam, you have the preservation of the sunnah of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the madhab of the salaf. This is what, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved his religion. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed the religion with ahla hadith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used Ahlul Hadith as a means to preserve his religion. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is imperative that we understand that and why we would depart from that after having safety and security in our religion and seeing how they dealt with the people of desires and innovation, why we would leave that is beyond me. But it only, can only be from our whims. And it can only lead to our destruction. As, a, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the Prophet said the Jews will break into 71 sects, Christians 72 sects, my ummah into 73 sects, all of them in the fire except one. And then they were asked, who are they, Ya Rasulullah? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Those who are upon what I'm upon And my companions are upon uh, Now So It shows us That we cannot allow Those Divisions And unclarity Or, or things that are unclear And distractions And new ideologies To take us away from our Islam and our Islam is based on the Quran and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the understanding of the Sahaba to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een and another doubt Dr. Qadi he mentioned he said I moved beyond the Athari strand so he moved beyond he progressed is what we can only infer that that means because he's he's saying so much. He's saying and he was mentioned about Keshav Shuhad and he would wipe out so much of the text and this and that and the other. So it shows that he believes he has progressed because that which was was uh, he was on before was not forward thinking. It wasn't uh, 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 giving him enough room to grow. It wasn't allowing him to flourish in his ideas. And in his spirituality, it was too restrictive. So that shows the danger of bid'a and hawa to let those things, those things to let your desires and the deception of the shaitan to let you then to go to negate the creed of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah that comes from the book and the Sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam. So it makes me ask and wonder because it wasn't clear what he was saying he moved beyond to. It just, he mentioned Dhok and he said a more mystical interpretation. So I don't know what it, did he mean because it sounded like, and many of you may not be aware of this, but what we refer to as the Twilight Zone. This is something, this is a, a classic television show from the 50s in America. And the author of it, Rod Serling, the one who, who wrote it, that the Twilight Zone were always very powerful uh predictions if you will of the future and they were always very had a very profound message in each episode and 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 just gave you so much food to think so it, it's either i don't know it sounds like yasser qadi that he has uh you know from what he is saying that his you know he, he doesn't want to be restrained anymore by those old paradigms so he's opening up to something new so we don't want to backbite Dr. Qadi we don't want to slander him but it sounds like it's in common with the Twilight Zone or it could also be the Sufi rationalism and this is what it sounds more consistent with in that when he says about Volk and he says about a more mystical interpretation and just in general now his usul seems more consistent with those uh, types of creed. Danger inherent in what Dr. Qadi is saying is if he's not sure, he's saying aqid is a development in process, you know, he's basically kind of saying that it's not tokifiyah as 
as the ulama in, uh, of Islam, especially the ulama of Ahl Sunnah, have uh, take that as a, a, a principle that it is divine, that the creed is divine, and that it is protected by Allah Azza wa Jal, and that we are ordered to believe and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in accordance with that creed which comes from the Quran and the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So for Yasir Qadi, Aqidah is a, is a development and process. But that I ask you, those who listen to him, what are you going to be upon if you follow someone like this whose Aqidah and creed and methodology is in pro progress? Because what you follow today and what he's upon tomorrow could be totally different, especially if it's in progress. It's going in a direction and it's not possible that if you're getting further away from classical interpretation that it could be in the right direction but rather we see that those ways are the ways of the du'at ala abwab jahannam so beware ahabatullah beware of those people who are changing because that means you are going to be flip-flopping and you're going to defend people and defend ways that flip-flop and Allah's not going to ask you about that Allah's going to ask you what you believe he's going to ask you about who your lord is and who your prophet is and what is your deen but if you say if you can't answer those things and you're answering well I made taqlid of so and so and so and so who this day was on this and this day was on this wa'iyadhan billah we don't know how, what kind of condition a person will die if they go just following uh, taqlid and following that which is not firm. And aqidah is firm. A last shubha that I wanted to mention, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and you, I mean. Uh, Dr. Qadi, he mentions, he says, anybody who is still stuck on trying to divide pr uh, practicing Muslims who are coming to the masajid, loving Allah, honestly, with utmost respect, that is a mindset that there is no hope to get across to. So this statement is also problematic for a couple of reasons. For one, we know where Yasser Qadi is striking out against. But he also mentions that those people who are blind followers of, could be Naqshbandi, uh, you know, Sufi sects, uh, like the, they could be Maturidiya, they could be Ashari, they could be Muta'asib, those people who are, have blind prejudice to their madhab. Okay, and, and, and blind followers of scholars in certain ways so that their intolerance that this uh, is dangerous for the ummah this is what he's basically saying and especially striking at Salafis however those people who truly adhere to the book in the sunnah according to the madhab of the Salaf then it is not possible if they're truly adhering to it then the, that they could just contradict it. I'm talking about those who are truly following, those that are true Salafis, that are truly following the minhaj of the Salaf Salih, because they know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hold on, all of you steadfast to the rope of Allah and do not divide. And they know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And ta'awun and cooperate all of you together. Jami'an. Uh, uh, adhere uh, cooperate in righteousness and piety and do not cooperate in enmity and discord so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these are commands from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so a true Sunni believes in this and is following this I'm talking about someone who is striving truly to follow the book and the Sunnah that means they're qasd their intention is never to, because that's the intention of the munafiqeen to divide. That's a that's a serious accusation. That's a a, a sifa of the uh, munafiqeen of the hypocrites that they seek to divide and destroy the ummah and destroy the people of good. Rather, Ahlul Sunnah is haris ala commanding the good and forbidding the evil. So they have to make clear what is haq, and they have to make clear what is batil, what is false. And they have to command the good and forbid the evil as the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. And first and foremost, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala commands us 
with commanding the good and forbidden the evil. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Min ra'a min kum munkarin, fa li yughayruhu bi yad, fa in lam yistati' fa bi lisanihi, fa in lam yistati' fa bi qalbihi, wa dhalika aruf al-iman, ruahu muslim. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, in the hadith of uh, Abi Sa'id al-Khudri, radiyallahu ta'ala, he said, I, uh, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever sees a munkar, whoever sees something sinful, then change it with his hand. If he's unable to do so, then change it with his tongue. Speak out against it. If he's then unable to do that, then hate it in his heart, and that's the weakest form of faith. So this is a part of Iman, bi'idhnillah ta'ala, if our intention is correct to please Allah and defend his religion from doubtfulness and bid'ah and zandaka and heresy from the wrong path and that which leads to destruction, that that is from the bab of commanding the good and forbidding the evil. How can we leave that as a principle? How can you say that you have to fight only those secularism and this and that and the other, but yet you don't fight the internal bid'ah that we're dealing with? And in fact, even secularism, we have secular uh, ideologies that are developing within the ummah that are trying to destroy the usul of Islam. So we have those progressive Muslims and those modernist Muslims and those secularist Muslims even. And so it's imperative that all bid'ah, as the Prophet ﷺ said, Kulu bid'ah tin dalala, all bid'ah is innovation and all bid'ah is misguidance. Wukulu dalala tin nar. And all misguidance leads to the hellfire. We have to understand that. So it's very important to understand that the Prophet ﷺ highlighted and prophesied that his ummah would divide. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that the ummah would divide and that this is something madhmuma, this is something negative. No one should accept that. But the fact that it happened and the fact that it would happen, we have to be prepared for it. And the only way we can get that unit, unity and adhere to the, we have to adhere to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah commands. Because those who don't hold on to the Quran and the Sunnah, they're not holding on to the rope of Allah. So how is it you can unite and have unity by other than that? How is it ever going to be substantial? Nor is it even desire that you just have unity on everything that has never been the history of Islam and we can't just fault the Muslims and just say oh that it's just evil it, it, you know so we we now we're going to unify we've come to progress to where all sects can be just have any belief and and go forward that's never going to happen nor it goes against it goes against all the nasus even the Prophet said there won't cease to be a group from my nation that's on the truth. There won't be uh, anyone who harms them, who disagrees with them, until the hour is established. So letting us know, Ahla Haq, Mojud, they're around and they will be around. Those who adhere to the book and the Sunnah, and how many of the Ulama Sunnah uh, explain that they're, they're Ahla Hadith, Imam Bukhari, Waghayrihim, Kathir, Yufassar had even uh, Imam uh, Ibn Hajr, him. There are so many aqwal of the ulama of sunnah to show that it's ahl sunnah. And that it's imperative that we stick and adhere and st hold steadfast to that rope. Walau kari al ahl kufr. Walau kari al kafirun. Walau kari al ahl bid'ah. Even if the disbelievers hate it, even if ahl bid'ah hate it, that we have to adhere to that which is right and correct. And that's how we establish our unity. That's how we unify. So it's not about causing divisions. Those people who cause division, they are people of fitna. And they are not making imtithal of sunnah. They are not examples of the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. They are not an example of salafiyyah. They are not an example of athariyyah. They are not an example of ahl hadith. They are not an example of ahl sunnati wal jama'ah. They're an example of extremism. They're an example of falling astray because of their hawa and, and going extreme. What an extreme means to jawaz al had. It means to go behind, beyond the had. So if you have the had, if you have the 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 line that's drawn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his boundaries. 
Golu and Tejawas mean it means to go beyond. It means to go beyond, to transgress beyond what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set his limits. So we don't accept that as well. And a last point I just wanted to make, Dr. Qadi, he mentioned about contextualizing the narrations of the Salaf, which is true. We have to uh, implement the, 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 the narrations of the Salaf holistically. And we have to realize the, the, times that, the time of the Salaf, what they face and how they dealt with Ahl al-Bid'ah. You know, there's Musali wa Mufasid, there's Fiqh and there's Hikmah and how we implement those things. When it's mashroor, when it's legislated to make hajr, and all these other masail, we have to contextualize. But we can never throw away and depart from that madhab as long as we have answers within that madhab. And if it takes ijtihad, la yadurana shay. It doesn't harm us. We still go back to the book and the sunnah as our base and qiyas or ijma. And if we don't find it in, in those three maratib of adilla, of evidences, and then we make qiyas, sound qiyas, uh, sound analogy. So there's always a way to deal with contemporary issues as they come, and they will keep coming far after us. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal, the Almighty, to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jal. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the Shaytan. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika and ushrika bika wa ana a'lamu astaghfiruk li ma'alamu. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all, forgive us all, guide us all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and Dr. Qadi, because Dr. Qadi has much influence. Dr. Qadi is well studied and well versed, but that shows that that's not sufficient. That doesn't give you guidance. There's many people who are knowledgeable who are not even Muslim. So, we just have to realize that we have to have an open heart about these matters and look at these matters uh, with uh, with ilm wa fiqh.